relationship. Okay. So a few things come to my mind watching Nixon and this whole saga, which is amazing. We'll get into the film in a minute, but the first is creep. Could there ever be a more <laughs> appropriate acronym for a presidential campaign? Second, for those of you who think that Locker Up was something that just came into vogue in the last few years when Hillary was running against Trump, they say, lock her, shut her up, lock her up. Um, there's other things that are so reminiscent about this, there's sort of a direct line between 1968 and 2023. It never ends. Um, we have somehow the unlimited capacity in this country for conspiracies. Uh, this is such a great, honestly, this is a fantastic film. I, 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 the audience is going to have a lot of questions for you, but were you even at all surprised that you were nominated for an Academy Award? Did you have some sense that this could happen? Anybody, everybody? No. No. I, mean, I didn't have a sense that it was going to happen when we first started making it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know we knew that we made a good film eventually. Yeah, we we're really confident that we had something great on our hands, but I didn't expect that we would have that whole journey. And I thought we might. <laughs> There's one out of three. That's, that kind of batting average works for me. Um, let's, can, if we could just unpack this in pieces. The first would be um, access, making of the film, access to the footage, um, the music, which is compelling in the film, uh, propulsive, driving it forward. So let's get, we have time, so let's get into making of the film, um, why you tackle the project, um, and sort of any challenges you may have faced with this kind of sort of explosive historical footage and putting it together. This is a story that needed to be told, I think, and wasn't previously. Um, so, Anne and I came up with this idea after hearing a podcast, actually, called Slow Burn, and Martha Mitchell was a character on that podcast, and we knew immediately that she was compelling, fascinating, funny, interesting, and cinematic. And like I wanted to see her, so we did some research online to see if there had been a documentary made about her, and there hadn't been, but we found some great YouTube clips and thought, this is a great character for a film. Um, and we were in a moment in 2019 when we started researching that was very politically complicated, as we all knew, um, the corrupt administration at that time. Um, there was a lot that was resonating politically for us in terms of Martha's story that resonated to the present day. So we started digging in and started digging into the archive and the archival materials. Which were um, based where? It was at the networks themselves or were they at the, at the International Archive? Where were the materials? At the Nixon Library is where we first started. Yeah. Um, Vanderbilt Media as well. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Do you want to? Like um, Genesis also. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think we knew that this, we wanted to tell a female-driven story, and she was sort of the perfect character for the time. And it was really important for us, for her to tell her own story. Clearly, she had been silenced. She wasn't known. She had been lost to history and had been gaslit. And so it was, it was important for us to do it in an archival form, but also for her to lead her own narrative as much as possible. So in, in that, give us a time frame uh, of how long you sort of, it took you to sort of dig through all the materials and start to shape your film in a way that you thought was, this is it, this is it, we've got the story. Any sense of that? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I think we started, we went to the Library of Congress in May of 2019, and then we, um, we, came, we sort of pulled together what we could from the internet, from, from Vanderbilt Media, um, and then we built a trailer and we kind of shopped it around and then Beth sort of came on board in like January 2020. Is that right? Let's go to Beth for a second. What are your, what, are your, 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 what was your jump in point and how close were these folks to basically having a finished product? Oh, got me. Okay. So, so, so Deb was working at Oscilloscope, which is a film distribution company at the time. and was editing things. So you guys were developing the project on the side. So, uh, so, and okay, so you had started work developing the project, researching it, 
finding the archival footage, identifying maybe how to go about the film. I think you did some initial interviews too, uh, Zoom interviews, and then you had a sample reel and a loose deck. And I think so you either came to me in like September of 2019, and, um, and I was really busy working on Storm Lake, like other projects, but I brought that here last year. I loved the project. I thought that Martha seemed really incredible. I mean, just she's so telegenic, grabs your attention. The story in that political moment, which is an extension of the political moment we're in, just seems so current, and yet it was 50 years old. So um, I just said I love this project. I can't do it right now. And if you need a producer in a couple of months, come back. You continued to shop the project. And then I think it was in early 2020. So you have the deck and some, some degree of a deck and the reel. And then also we, I had a producing partner on the project, Judith Mizraki, and we came on board. And, um, and we really worked to finesse the materials, the sales materials. We worked to have the strength in the deck, strength in the, yeah, the sample reel, and we drew up a budget. And then, you know, we had those three things that you really need to, to pitch your project. And we had a real ally in Tom Powers, who runs the Toronto International Film Festival. And so he helped us, and we had a bunch of meetings. But Anne, you had been developing, and the two of you had been developing the story, and you even had like a long extended cut of yeah. like maybe 120 minutes. And one thing, it was, it was long, right? It's long. Yeah. yeah. It's a long assembly, because we weren't sure how much of Waterdeep was going to incorporate. Yeah. So anyway, in the beginning, so we, it was, we were developing as a feature film at full length, and then we started to discuss Maybe this should really be a short because we realized the only way to make it feature length was to regurgitate the Waterdeep story, which people had heard so many times before and seen. This material feels so fresh because people haven't seen it. People had seen a lot of that mix of material before. So as we were pitching, we kind of pivoted to a short. We thought it'd be a 40 minute short, uh, which is, by the way, the uh, to have your film qualify for an Academy Award in the short category, it has to be 40 minutes or less. So we decided to aim for a 40 minute short, and then Netflix came on board, and with that we had the juice to really um, make the film. They did not come in with the full budget, um, and they actually, we had to bring our budget way down, actually, for Netflix to come in. Um, so then we had um, an independent uh, donor who filled the gap. And then we could really just, and it was such a privilege in so many ways, we could just make the film. We had the budget, and we could just do it. And just to say also, since it might become part of the conversation, Netflix was fairly um, open with us that they look for about four film, short films a year for Academy contention. And so when they came on board, they felt like the film had that potential. I see. So that's where the sort of the initial thought about Academy qualifying came from Netflix when they saw the finished material. Well, when they saw so when, with the pitch. When, when they came, when they bought the and pitch. And that was really it was okay. like a seven-minute reel and a deck, and and they 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 came on board with with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, I mean, in itself, it's fascinating. I did not know that there was a feature cut or there was a feature brewing there, but you, you guys all just showing that that was the essential part of the Mitchell story. And also because I thought, for me also, at that time, and things have only, the market has only gotten more challenging, but to try to make a feature film, it was going to be really expensive, all of the footage, and take a lot of time. And so it was sort of like, also, do you want to complete the film, or do you want to spend three to five years trying to raise money, you might not be successful in raising that much. You know, spend three to five years trying to raise all that money to make a feature. Yeah, we also uh, we just knew that we weren't going to tell her full story either, like a cradle to grave type kind of story, because we didn't have a lot of archival materials of her from her early years, and we really wanted to hone in on the Watergate story and that scandal and how she was treated at that time too. 
I mean, we were also coming up on the 50th anniversary, so we wanted to try to capitalize on that. And also, she wasn't a known character. We were a little worried about selling this film with someone who the general population had completely forgotten about. You know. Of course, now she's quite well known, which is great. You know, through hopefully this film and Gaslit as well, which is a Roberts vehicle. It, it truly, the film itself is utterly complete at 40 minutes. There is no doubt. Uh, we use that as a benchmark too. 40 minutes and under is a short film that we'll take. And we, we, you know, last couple of years we've migrated away from taking long shorts because it's very difficult to program. Um, but when they're this good, we program them. Or in this case, of course, you want to do a special presentation. Uh, a couple of things struck me during the film, and uh, maybe you'll all recall this. Number one, pre-cable, we had three basic networks, and everybody watched them. So when you see Roger Rudd up there all the time, or Dan Rather reporting. Think about the impact that had on you in terms of the power of reporting and the belief system that we had then. If Walter Cronkite said it was true, it was true. Or if even he hinted at something. This is how strong media was at that time. It was not diluted. The other thing that just struck me again, Woodward and Bernstein. They broke this, they broke this thing so wide open and they were determined, of course, to make sure that we all knew what the hell happened. Um, and the uh, final thing is Nixon taped himself. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Filmed himself. They just could not help themselves. They were criminals and egotists at the same time. It's potent. Um, what's that? They go hand in hand, exactly. Um, all these things just flooded into my mind. Because that, that period, oh, and the final thing is there was a bumper sticker in Massachusetts that said, don't blame us, we voted for McGovern. <laughs> Only one state voted for the government. Nixon got the other 49. No. Uh, so, and let's talk about the Oscar nomination. First learning about that, you know, heartbeat, all of that, uh, racing heart, and then everything that came up to Oscar night. If you just take any, any part of that, it's a long process. You, when did they announce the nominations? In, uh, in late, um, late 20, what was it, late 22? The, the nominations come in late January. So late they came January. in late January. So, I mean, what people don't know, and you kind of don't want to know, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole campaign. I think that's what people don't necessarily realize. It's not like you wake up and suddenly you've been nominated. I mean, you do wake up and you've suddenly been nominated, but it's, it comes at the end of a whole process. So, and there are rules and regulations in order to be nominated, and so you have to be tactical from the start if you want to have an Academy run. So, for example, you have to have a certain number of theatrical runs, um, or sh uh, showings in major cities, and, and those rules have actually somewhat changed in the past year, but you know, we had a theatrical run in New York and LA, and, um, and then, uh, there, you have a number of screenings so that the Academy members become aware of your film. When you're watching the Academy Awards and, and someone wins and they say, I'd like to thank the Academy, that's because the Academy as a whole votes on your film. And if you are in the running, you are having, uh, you're sort of having what I call hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're, you're meeting Academy members for months and months and getting word out about your film and having special screenings and receptions and dinners and all this thing, all these things. So I think we were, so, so, so we knew we were gonna run and then we were shortlisted. So we were in the final 15 by November of 2022. And then between November and January, it's a period between shortlist and nominations. So a lot of the field has been weeded out. There, I think there were like maybe 160 shorts originally in the running, and then it goes down to 15, and then um, once you're nominated, it, it goes down to the final five. And then the rules change once again, and you can't have the same kinds of screenings and dinners, but uh, we were on a campaign trail for six months. And some films campaign because the Academy is international. Some films have screenings. You know, they go to Berlin and Copenhagen and London. 
um, to scream so, and and try to he tried to draw the academy. Did you do that? Did international travel behind it? No. We we didn't we didn't so um, and we, you know it's a very American film so we were sort of saying to our Netflix team shouldn't we um, try to have some of these screenings to raise awareness of the film internationally. Um, and I think Netflix felt like there wasn't necessarily a strong return on the investment. So, yeah, but anyway, so it's a long, strategic, multi-PR person uh, uh, campaign. Now, does Netflix fund that so that it doesn't, that's not out of pocket by any of that? They fund the whole campaign? They, yeah, they fund the campaign, yeah. Um, they, I will say, full transparency, like we didn't get paid for the campaign at all. We don't get paid for our time to be on that campaign trail. But they expect, um, you, they expect you to do it, but they don't pay you for it. They, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they want you to do it, and we wanted to be there. Of course, we wanted to represent our film and talk about Martha and get people to watch it, because ultimately, all that attention, the best part of it is that people are going to watch your film, which, as filmmakers, that's what you want. So, yeah, so, I mean, we were totally on board with the whole campaign. Um, but yeah, it would have been nice if we got like some sort of fee for our time. <laughs> but I, I will, it's, it's a real conversation in the independent field because independent filmmakers, whether you're an independent documentary filmmaker or you're an independent fiction filmmaker, you're at a terrible disadvantage if you have no budget for your campaign. You just simply can't compete. Um, so that that is a reality of the Academy um, process and you know we had um, you know there was, a, I, uh, there was this incredible film haul out um, and they just had absolutely no money to market themselves and it was really under the radar but um, you know it was, it was really interesting to have a, a, a front seat view of the um, the difference that deeper pockets can make on a campaign that ultimately won. It was a film about elephants. Please give me the full title of that. Do you guys remember what it called? The Elephant Whisperers? The Elephant Whisperer. Do you think, did that have, I didn't see it, did that have a more international appeal? Because we know the Martha film is very domestic. I was curious. That the Elephant Whisperer was, <coughs> yes, you think yes? It has baby elephants. <laughs> I, think, I think that was it. Baby elephant. <laughs> okay. So, so, my question is, if that was an easier sell to international voters, could that have been the difference between why that film? But you can't, you have to speculate. I grant that there's no way inside the sort of Byzantine world here of New York. But um, do you think that they had more traction internationally and it could have gotten them over the top? Because I don't, I don't see how that's a better film. I'm just saying. <laughs> I this is my feeling. Baby elephants. And also I think, you know, you're nominated with the documentary branch, but then the full academy, so eleven thousand members vote for eleven thousand. Eleven thousand right? members yeah. in the academy. And okay. I think a lot of them don't watch because there's a lot to watch, especially a doc short. They probably don't even watch the doc feature. So I think a lot of people are like looking at the list and they're like, elephant. So sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all the categories are really different. So the Doc Short category, Academy members admit that they they um, they don't watch them all the time. So in a lot of cases, they don't vote. You abstain. Um, so I'm an Academy voter and member, and, and there are there was a category this year that I abstained in. I think I didn't vote on the animated. Uh, Short, I think, maybe. Because um, I just didn't watch them. But they don't always abstain. They, they just vote. And it's sort of, a, it's, a little, it's a bit of a problem. But, um, but it was funny because see, um, The Elephant Whispers is also a Netflix film. And we would screen with them. And we were on tour with Kartiki, um, who directed Elephant Whispers. But it was, what, what was the funny joke about how Elephant, you know, elephants being the symbol of the Democratic Party, and then, so like it, that was screen a Republican Party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then our film, so there was some, some funny joke happening that I thought was funny, but I can't remember the joke exactly. Or right, can you get us to the Oscars now, and you know, dressing up, going to the Oscars, anticipation, could we win? I don't know. Let's see. What was that night like? <laughs> um, 
Um, I feel like the night, in a weird way, was, it was calming and relaxing because there was so much build up to it and it was almost like a relief, like, okay, we're here, we're done, so let's just enjoy it. So I mean, I just, I really enjoyed it, regardless of what happened. I thought it was the sort of the, the campaign and the, everything that led up to it that was a little bit stressful. Like we, Deborah and I, and Beth as well, were doing, you know, sometimes five interviews a day. It was a, there was a lot going on. Uh, at the point of the of the ceremonies, or prior to? Prior to, so, so it was the build up. And Netflix arranged all those interviews. Wow. Okay. Yeah, there was a big PR campaign. So we and you know this was also during the pandemic and towards the end of the pandemic, if we are at the end of the pandemic. Um, so a lot of this was happening over Zoom, um, and a lot of our actual production happened over Zoom as well, and the making of the film happened over Zoom. Um, so a lot of our campaign happened during Zoom or during um, a time when we couldn't gather in person and so when all that started ramping up, um, it was uh, it was very, uh, I mean, it added stress, I think, for me, at least, to like be amongst people, again, after not having been amongst people in a long time, um, but, yeah. You would describe it as an immersive experience, <coughs> the whole lead up to it, and it's interesting to take on the night itself, which is, okay, we're here, let's just, Call her name. I think I wrote a speech. Do you have something prepared, by the way, in case you want? Yes. Yay! Would you like to share that with us? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll leave that one to the dustbin of history. Um, okay. I mean, you know the expression. I could go on. I'm not. So let's go to the audience and see. There's got to be questions. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is for speak up. Speak up. Speak up. Um, we're about two generations removed from the events here. I'm curious as to whether you, in screening this, had different reactions from people who lived through this versus people for whom it is essentially ancient history. Yeah, I think we can all speak to it. I mean, this audience, right. you, you, you were so alive <laughs> and laughing and talking to one another, like elbowing each other. Remember that? You know, so, so there are people in this audience who really lived through that and it, it was really fun to screen the film in, across the country and, and people come up to us and say, oh, like, I remember this, or someone who knew Martha, or you know, just the, the range of experiences. And yeah, I think that the a younger audience is in some ways, like in some cases, learning about Watergate through, through the film. So the responses are really different. I think what's... Um, like this screening, I was so distracted because I was thinking, oh my God, like look what, look what's happening now. And it's interesting, on my drive up yesterday, I was listening to NPR and somebody was talking about how this bookends the chapter, like what we're going through now with Trump and his cronies bookends the chapter from Watergate, like an end of a chapter. In a way, I'm like, wait, what's the ending? But, but anyway, just, I was re ending, watching it, and to be honest, Lloyd, when we watched it now, it was the first time, and it's so funny, first time, I mean, I've seen this like 45 times, first time I heard the lock her up. I, it registered for me today in a way that it never did. So it's, so I think what's, you know, what I appreciate about the film, just from my seat, I guess I'd say, which is not your question at all, is just how it continues to uh, resonate in different ways, given the political, um, criminal moment that we're in now. But do you guys have any thoughts about audience? Yeah, I mean, I would say that I always, my favorite moments are when I'm like sitting behind women in particular and they're like, mm-hmm, uh-huh, <laughs> yep, same. <laughs> so that's my favorite. Yeah, I have, um, I have a lot of nieces and nephews and from the 30-something niece down to the 15-year-old niece all really love this film and not just because they're anti Bayek, but they find Martha to be like a very compelling character and they didn't know anything about her history and they're always shocked and surprised and so it's resonating with the younger generation, which is really great. Yeah, I'll just say that my kids, so they saw it when they were 15 and 17 and they said, Mom, this is your best movie. Oh. <laughs> this is your best movie? They've not seen your, your reference or your catalog, believe me, they've not seen it. <laughs> 
many of you were here for Storm Lake two years ago, you know. This is why that's not a movie by Seriously, she attaches herself to the best, pro best uh, projects and either she produces them or she directs them. So this is just one more. But it's, this, is, this is a great film. But now my curiosity is really wet over the idea of the feature. You know, what would that have looked like? Uh, even if it was a 60 minute feature, I think I could have absorbed another 20 minutes of Martha. But if the, if the material wasn't there, it wasn't there. Um, but whatever. I mean, I think it would have been hard to have kept it all archival, to be yeah. perfectly honest. We were limited to the, to the amount of archival. There's no home movies of her. We just had her media appearances. Yeah, I and I mean, we milked it. Yeah, we really sure. did. But one wouldn't have known. Also, questions, please. Yes. Uh, back. Yes. We is that Sarah? Oh. No, it's not Sarah. It's Jorge. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, but my sister saw it. Um, yes, thanks so much. I just love this film. Um, I guess a couple of things. I'd love to hear more about the process of editing the material together. I, like, the editing is so, um, it just, like, moves through the material in such an amazing pace with all of these moments where we can stop and absorb, like, her facial expression and, then, like, <coughs> just, like, these, these moments where we really get, like, familiar and intimate to her. Um, yeah, so just the process of editing this material together and the decisions you made. And also just, like, collecting all of it, like, you know, what was that like, you know, how did you, what did that research look like? It feels to me like, you know, when you describe, like, the conception to the realization of the film seems really fast to me, but, you know, um, so it seems like, I'm just curious, like, what you've done. And also, it was really interesting to hear the story of <laughs> um, the nomination process, but also, now I understand why, like, it's like every year, some films that I really love are nominated for Oscars, and then like the <coughs> octopus movie wins, or like whatever. So that's not that that was a bad film, but just you know, like, <coughs> the one with like the catchiest, kind of easiest, simple, most marketable kind of. Topic. Did everybody hear the questions? No. No. Well, Sorry. Sorry. That's okay, but largely focuses <coughs> around the editing process. Yeah. Number one, and then your sort of um, the idea that the the Academy Award nomination process seems random sometimes. I don't know if that was your question, but... No, it's just, drink, a, com just a comment, yeah. Okay. I mean, editing and archival research, so I can start with the editing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we did a long assembly of just sort of all the moments of Watergate and, like, where Martha sort of had an impact and sort of pulled that out. And I also did a separate, like, radio cut of just um, her voice, like, just pulling her voice, like how much can she narrate this? And then realizing like, ooh, she can't really tell her own story. We need some contextualization, you know? And so that's when we came up with the idea of doing contemporary um, audio interviews, which we actually did on Zoom. We should have thanked Zoom in the credits. Um, so <laughs> we, um, uh, so yeah, so it was just really sort of whittling it all down. And also just pulling, I love to pull out gems, you know, and try to cut around those, and there were so many with her. I mean, she's just such an amazing performer, character, and she's really, so she, and it's so funny. So try to keep as much of the humor as, as possible, although we couldn't obviously keep everything. So, it, you know, it, it was a kind of a long process, but it did come together pretty quickly, but because it's an archival piece, and we knew the beginning, middle, and end, so to a certain extent, that helps a lot. Yeah, um, in terms of the archival, um, yeah, it was a long process. We were digging up until the end, really. Um, but we got a lot from Vanderbilt, um, which is an online database, online collection of all news archival material. Library of Congress, Nixon Library was huge, huge resource for us. And Ryan Pettigrew is an archivist there who's totally amazing and really helped us um, get access to materials like throughout the pandemic when the archives had actually closed down and weren't letting people come in and research in person. Um, but yeah, there was stuff that I found at an uh, archive in Arkansas that was the her and her cat eyeglasses when she talked about keeping the politicians straight and not crooked. That was a very early find and when I saw that I was like, oh, we've got a film with this character. And like that. There were gems like that that were just really amazing. Um, and yeah, we got some stuff from news sources. We fair used a lot of it, but we also did have to end up licensing a lot of the material. 
Um, and as Anne said, like as we were collecting all this material, like I, we kept coming across characters like, oh, let's let's talk to John Dean, like let's get some context for the people that actually knew her, and like you know find someone that could speak personally about her, like Piper in the film knew her as a young woman. Um, so it was that whole research process was really fun to try and find these people and get access to them. Was it the case with Bob Woodward? Too? You're you're also doing an interview with him, or these are pre-existing, not with Woodward. Okay. Just, uh, um, I just want to, part of that editing, which is almost, I mean, it's not part of the editing, but I just want to acknowledge a part of the film that I love to acknowledge, but the graphics and the newspaper, um, the, the newspaper sections and the headlines, uh, we worked with this really incredible uh, graphic designer, this guy named Matt Eller, and he originally came on to just sort of help with graphics, and then he really fell in love with the project and wanted to art direct it and really helped with even the framing of archival photographs and and did and those red arrows and helped with the framing and the highlighting of those newspaper sections. And I think it's such an important part of the film and gives so much context and also works so seamlessly. Um, but the other place, you also asked where the challenges were. and. Um, we did have a challenge when Martha was recalling events from the past, like when they locked her up in the hotel room. And for a period of time, you were relying on like 1970s like B movies to illustrate sort of hysteria. I don't know, maybe you want to talk about that process. Yeah. But it was a really, I think it was like a really important development in the editorial process. Yeah, so yeah, we were going back and forth that. It, it just felt like it took you out of her story. And, um, you know, I think it was Netflix who was like, you should lean into the archival, which we wanted to do, we just couldn't quite figure it out. And we brought on this amazing um, editor to help finish it for a week, um, Toby Shannon. Amazing. And, um, and she was like, oh, I'm gonna lean into the archival. And so she just, she just did it and had the fresh eyes. And it, it slowed the footage down and no one sort of, what we call the gaslighting sequence, I don't know, I think it really worked. And it's an amazing sound design as well. More questions, please. Steve, up here, go ahead, Steve. Um, two things, just on a personal note. Um, I live a block from where the Mitchells live in New York. And it's impossible to really fully grasp the scrum of reporters that lived on 84th and 5th Avenue for several years. teach at um, Sarah Lawrence, and I was just speaking to my students last um, last week, and I think that the short form has always been seen as this sort of stepping stone, like you make the short to make a feature, but it's not maybe always legitimate in its own right. 
and and certainly now netflix h b o and m t v especially a lot of these different distributors are buying shorts to be in the academy race i mean they're kind of seen as academy vehicles for those who sort of want awards so you know i know that there's a whole school of thought like casey neistat has been talking for years about the power of youtube it's free it's available to everyone as a platform for documentaries and yet i think that we as filmmakers for example well first of all we can't afford to make films that we just put on youtube because you don't make any money you're putting it out there for free you're not getting any return for your labor your labor is not recognized it gets lost in a sea so we are all looking for our our film to be curated selected distributed um so i think it's a great question i guess i would just say i think that the short is and always has been a totally legitimate form it's the right form for many films it can be so effective and um and i guess i would only disagree i think that in on one point which is that i think some films are fantastic at feature length and sometimes you want more i but i i won't you know it's funny because uh you know i'll just refer to this film because i know some of the people in the audience have seen it but like storm lake you know it was 85 minutes when we did our 60 minute cut i was like and i was kicking and screaming and then i was like it's actually really good it moves fast and so um yeah so we kick and scream about it but it's also it's often not a bad thing and i don't know you know it's like an ecosystem i think we need all kinds Right here, please. Thank don't don't take one more. Thank you. I'm, I'm Anna Zidi. I'm a graduate student at Rutgers University taking screening. And I don't know if this is enough time to even go into this, but you talked about the pitch. And I think we've been learning about how to pitch our project. And you mentioned you did a little short cut or something of it. Would you mind talking a little bit about the pitch? How that worked? And what worked about it? Why they yeah. got it what they wanted to get? Yeah, Anna and I started pitching this very early. Um, so in 2019, we went to Double Exposure Film Festival, and that was the first time we like publicly kind of presented the project and the idea and another little short reel that we had made. Um, so your the the pitch we had then it didn't have we didn't have like a deck or anything to share at that point, um, but we had like the loose outline of what we really wanted to do, and we did have like a little trailer that we had made um, that Anne had cut together, um, and we pitched it at another pitch session. Some of this is blurring because it was pandemic times too. Um, with Doc NYC, I guess we did pitching at Doc NYC. Yeah, that was like an early program. Um, where else did we do pitching? We pitched it to um, a production company who was trying to pitch it as a feature to HBO and HBO passed and that's when we did the deck. And so then we were sort of rethinking like should it be, maybe it should be, a sh maybe it should go back to what we originally thought was the, the short. Um, do you want to talk about that? Well, I mean, there are pitch forums, so just, just for people who don't know, there are there are these opportunities as filmmakers for you to pitch your film, so there, that's what you're referring to in large part, and then, but also you're doing a lot of individual pitching, so we pitched The New Yorker, we pitched New York Times to Opdot, we pitched CNN, so those were Zoom calls, we pitched um, uh, Hulu, yes, we pitched Netflix, and, you know, the really important I mean, I remember, because we were really strategizing our pitch. You have to strategize, you know? So it's, you know, what is the story? How are you gonna tell it? And then I feel like the really third and important piece is why are you the person to make this film? And so I think that we felt like we had some strength. We were an all-female team. You know, I always, I just, just so distinctly remember when we were pitching, you know, uh, Brittany um, Fears was fighting her um, free, free yeah, with free Britney, you yeah. know, that was happening. So there was this contemporary quality. And so, you know, the other thing that you always have to answer is why now? And and that was a, something that we really sort of drilled into. And, and we had, it was very orchestrated. Like we knew what role Anne was going to play. We knew what role Deb was going to play. We knew what role that I was going to play. So it was sort of like a seamless um, performance, so to speak. Very, very good answer. Let's take one more question. We haven't gone to the balcony, so way back in the way back, yes. So I'd like to sort of turn the telescope around 
Lloyd has been focusing on the gala of the Academy Awards, but here you are at the Middlebury New Filmmakers Festival, number nine. And I wanted to get your perspective as filmmakers on what we're doing here and the power of having this gathering in our small town and why it matters. I would love to take that first, if you don't mind. Um, I have so many thoughts about this because I think I've been coming to this festival for seven years. I don't know if you know what a remarkable festival this is and the care that Lloyd and Jay put into it. Um, and so I just want to say it's, it is so well run that you have these programming blocks that allow you to kind of schedule your time and then Lloyd is so thoughtful about events and panels in between. And, um, and the care that is, um, that with which you treat filmmakers, I've, I've stayed with the McKennas for two years and it's one of my favorite times of the year. There is such generosity in this community, the way that you all open your doors to filmmakers and, and house them and feed them and um, this generous swag bag the quality of the communication. I just want to say that Lloyd offered to do an itinerary for me, and I was like, oh sure, I'm really busy, that would help. I've never received an itinerary like Lloyd did for me. And the quality of the Q&As that you're getting, I'll just say that Anonymous Sister was a film that was here last year, and um, Jamie Boyle told me that the single best Q&A that she has had in over 100 screenings was here at the Middlebury New Filmmakers Festival. So I think, so this is what it's really all about. It, I, I'll say, and, it's, and it, it's, I, as filmmakers, this is what it's all about. It's the opportunity for us to share our films with live audiences, to get your reactions, to get your questions, to get your critique. It helps us as filmmakers. It gives us the gas and the tank that we need to get go to keep going because it's actually really hard. This movie was funded, and we could just make it. But there are filmmakers in this audience who are laying down the track as they're going, and they might have to stop the train because they have no money for six months or a year. So this is what it's really all about. And I guess I just want to. Um, I just want to thank all of you, the community that you've built around this festival in such a short period of time. I mean, I've been to Cannes, I've been to Sundance, and this one, to me, continues to stand alone. So it's what it's all about, but it's what it's all about because it's also done really well, thanks to all of you and Lloyd and Jay. Just to take one moment, this is, this is a question for me, First of all, to the two directors, are you working together on another project or separately? If you could just let the audience know, or it's just too early to please fill us in. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we're I think we're still thinking about doing a podcast because there actually is this this treasure trove of uh, hundred audio tapes of Martha with the journalist with Evil McClendon that's in the film. Um, we just don't have access to the footage or sort of the audio yet, so that's sort of Share a little bit about what we may see from you in 2024, for instance. Um, yeah, I'm producing, I've been working on a film since 2017, so six or seven years, I guess, six years, seven, going on seven, about an avant-garde fashion collective called Three or Four that probably most of you have never heard of, but they're really amazing, and it's the um, directorial debut of a celebrity figure, so that's finally, I'm actually today going to watch the rough cut later this afternoon, it's finally rounding a corner, it's been 11 years in the making. Um, and then um, I'm also producing a play um, and a documentary about its staging and the creative and emotional and the legal risks that the playwright is facing in mounting a fictional adaptation of her own story on the stage. And then, um, Actually, I'm executive producing a film that has its roots in Millbury College. I was a geography major, 
and my Geography 101 class was about a region, a contested region between um, Azerbaijan and Armenia called Nagorno-Karabakh. It was when Ron Leibowitz, for those who know, was a geography professor. He was my Geography 101 professor and later became the president of the college. Um, and uh, so, to, I'm ex so the, the filmmaking team, is, it's an Armenian filmmaking team, and they were looking for a producer who knew something about Nagorno-Karabakh because no one's heard of it. And Toby, who worked on this film and is a friend, uh, had seen the footage and was like, you gotta see this film. It's about a boy coming of age against the backdrop of war, and it's amazing. I can't remember what the place is called. I've never heard of it, but you should check out the real. And sure enough, it was Nagorno-Karabakh. And I was like, that's what I studied in Geography 101. And that's why I became a geography major. Um, so I'm executive producing that film and, and a film about cowboys, aging cowboys. And then, um, and then if any of you saw it with Peter Bradley, we're working on getting that out into the world right now. And, and finishing Storm Lake's impact campaign. And I'll just say that um, it's been screening around for now um, two and a half years. And we decided to end the impact campaign in November of this year. And we want to hit all 50 states, have community screenings in all 50 states. And we're at 49. If anyone has amazing contacts in Utah, it's the one crazy holdout. <laughs> So, also staying yeah. busy is what I would say. Yes? <laughs> yes, Beth? Well, um, it's funny because, you know, one thing that's happened is that there's been this real change in the market and everything has gotten, has slowed. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really hard to anticipate schedules. So some of my projects have really had to slow down for a lack of funding or trouble securing funding or for whatever reason. And so it, there's a little bit of a... Uh, a smash up, yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing all that. Um, before we go, and we'll acknowledge our filmmakers one more time, just a couple of programming notes for you. We will be, uh, we programmed today at Dana very specifically. The films that are coming up next is a film called A Revolution on Canvas. This is a film about an Iranian artist who went into exile. He hated the Shah, and he thought when the revolution came that he would be. It would be, you know, a beautiful time. The mullahs hated him even more. Oh. And he is in exile in New York, uh, continues his artwork. This is a powerful textured film that if you wish to get another <coughs> dose of history, it is, it, it's extraordinary, it's very vital with one best documentary feature here called The Revolution on Canvas, but we all put that at 11.30. At two o'clock, uh, a film I saw at Berkshire called Against All Enemies. We'll screen here. Um, the connection between the era of Nixon and the era of Trump, we talked about this. And this is basically a film about ex-military who are essentially leading the right wing in this country in directions that make us all very, very concerned. And the director, Charlie Sadoff, will be here for that along with the producer at two o'clock. So we try to program today that if you, if you have interest in sort of deep diving into these really quite important historical moments, come back. Otherwise, you all have your programs. We've got an extensive program today, uh, throughout the day and into the evening. Uh, we'll be at, uh, there'll be a party, a happy hour uh, at, uh, before I forget, Alexander Payne is gonna do a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jay Craven today. We have to make a call soon about the weather. If somebody knows, you know, rabbi or priest who has insights as to what it will look like at four o'clock, let me know. But we may go indoors at Middlebury Inn. It'll be our coffee and cookies conversation with Alexander Payne at four. There's a happy hour for festival pass holders and others, uh, filmmakers, at uh, inside the lobby of the uh, Middlebury Inn from 5 to 6. Um, and then we'll be back up at 7.15 with a quite dynamic evening schedule, including what well, we've up on four screens tonight. Um, so with that, let me thank you folks. I, honestly, this is one of the greatest experiences I've ever had here, listening to you, watching this film again. So could we give it a round of applause? <laughs>